who are you are non Belgian or non Dutch? So who are foreign around? Then I'll explain a little bit. Over here, there's the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. That's the city of Antwerp. That's a nuclear power plant of Doel. This is a Dutch polder. That's a Belgian polder. And one whole uh, system of realignment, it will mean that it will dig away the, the levy both on the Belgium and the Dutch side. And this has two reasons. One is to compensate nature for building uh, in, in uh, Middelburg Slu, some area. The Belgium use it as kind of compensation for the dredging of the harbor of Antwerp because the big container ships uh, need to go through the harbor. You see here's the dock of the, the container vessel and they will build a new container dock over there. So it's a lot of uh, works going on and that means that uh, due to that, with a lot of problems with, <laughs> with, ju with uh, jurisdictions uh, reasons, they had this. So this levy at the end will go away and this will be inundated and it will mean that the city of Antwerp will have 30 centimeters of lower water level. And the other thing is one of the research items we're doing, I think the TU Delft together with uh, Delta is doing this, is to calculate how much impact a foreshore before a levy will have on, let's say, reduction of wave uh, impact and wave height. And we think it's about one and a half meter, and that will mean if you combine it with sea level rise, you can, get, you, you, you can if you put more foreshores before a levy, and I know the dredges in Belgium and I also Van Oort and Boscalis are working on about creating artificial foreshores, with, uh, then you, can, uh, yeah, you ha can gain about 75 years uh, climate change uh, approach. But that's theory, <laughs> and you know, theory is nothing worse until you've tried it in practice, and that's what we're trying to do over here. Polder to Seas, a unique opportunity. Climate change is affecting the countries in the Two Seas region faster and to a greater extent than was previously expected. Rising sea level is a serious threat. We can improve our knowledge of how strong our flood defences are. We can improve how we organise our emergency response in practice. We have a shortage of trained water managers. Knowledge is not being transferred from one generation to the next. And we need to increase public flood awareness. The Hedvige Prosper Polder is being transformed into new tidal nature. This offers a unique opportunity of a six square kilometers living lab environment where polder to seas can conduct all kinds of experiments. Failure tests are being carried out and emergency response is being practiced under controlled but very realistic conditions. Polder to seas is part of the Interreg to seas de mer Tweezeen program. We are focusing on four activities, testing flood defenses, practicing emergency response, improving our knowledge infrastructure, and building a field station. We are researching the strength of flood defenses. We are doing this by conducting destructive field tests and a survey. The Polder to Seas project will develop an action plan for international collaboration and innovative tools to improve flood defense. We will design new and better emergency response plans by doing levy inspection exercises, testing emergency measures, initiating controlled breaches and closing them afterwards, and preparing for European crisis exercises. We will formalize knowledge transfer and educate the next generation of water managers. We want existing and new knowledge to be easily available and accessible. That's why we are organizing winter schools. Besides this, we are organizing levy challenges and we are developing educational videos, toolboxes and many more practical educational solutions. We are building a field station at the project site. It will be used during and after the project for educational purposes, research and as a special meeting place for exclusive occasions. Thirteen partners from the Two Seas region have joined forces to deliver the Polder to Seas project, supported by 34 observer partners. 
Together, we aim to prepare the Two Seas region for the climate change challenges that lie ahead. Our partners are the real stars of this project. They make adaptation to climate change happen. To see how you can contribute, find out more on www.poldertoseas.eu. Okay. So what we're doing is we have a main focus, so we, we try to get protection against and adaptation of the consequences. This is six square kilometers of an uh, area which will turn into nature area. And we think it's a kind of playground for engineers where we do the testing of kind of things. And what is the nice thing is it is not only a coastal area because the river Scheld is also a river. So it's a combination of an estuary where you have both impact from a river system with more rain and uh, a sea level rise uh, area. So it's a kind of interesting area over there. So the focus will be, do we really do full scale destructive test? And what does this mean? That we're more or less simulating a real storm, not just an average storm we normally have, but real, the real heavy stuff, uh, gale 11, uh, an awful lot of rain, high tide. And we really want to destroy the levee because we can allow it because it built a new levee behind it. And the other thing is, we also have emergency response. And it will mean that we try to do not only make more resilience of the infrastructure, the levee itself, but also of the emergency organizations and the emergency response. So we try and work on the kind of thing we call robust, uh, robust infrastructure, robust resilience. And the other thing is that we together with uh, three universities, uh, KU Leuven, TU Delft, and uh, a University of Applied Sciences in uh, Flissingen, which is probably uh, HBO, uh, we're working together to educate also the next generation of students. So that means that the next generation of people are going to work in the field. And they're really involved. And we also have things like levy challenges where we uh, yeah, give them uh, the time of their life to play around, uh, destroy something <laughs> or repair something. <laughs> and what we last year day was quite funny, that we had a group of students from the KU Leuven and the TU Delft. First, the people from Leuven had to destroy part of the levy. And the people from Delft also had to part to destroy. And then when they were finished with that, we swapped the teams. So they had to, the, the people from Delft have to repair the, the damage from Leuven and because they didn't knew that completely. So it was quite funny. And you get a kind of fierce competition. And I must say the Belgian one, but that's a different story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that's still a bit of point that the people from the University of Delft are a bit annoyed about. But okay. So what are we going to do? We use the works over there, and we're somewhere over here. So we are 2021. We already did a lot of experiments, and now we're really going to the full scale, which it means is that normally you go from, when you do an experiment, you start small in the lab, and then you go bigger and bigger and bigger. So we are already had passed the phase of the lab experiments. We already have done some experience in the field. And now we're really going for the big scale experiments in the real scale demolitions and all kinds of things and destructions of levees. How does it work? You see here a kind of overflow system. Here's an apparatus which measures the time the experiments are going on. This is 40 minutes. And the same stretch of levee, and that's what is quite interesting, we have one place where we have a, about 30 hours, 30 minutes, and 30 seconds, a 30 centimeter wave overtopping, and where the levee was still perfect. And we had an, about four meters apart where the stretch where ha this thing happens, and that after about, I think, one hour and a quarter, uh, the whole levee was more or less collapsing. So it's quite strange. It looks robust, it looks the same, but it still works very different. And this is the combination of the, the, the University of uh, Leuven used more coconut fibers, the, the people from Delft used more uh, technical fibers, and, and especially the environmental impact of that is quite good, and it even was uh, as strong as uh, normally. And the same thing, it was, was quite windy at those days, and uh, the people from Delft who were trying to apply this were kite surfing without ropes. So that's more or less uh, the, the way they did it. <laughs> So they used, had to use the weight of the, of the other students to get the, the, the foil back again on the place. So it's, it's, it was also quite interesting to see that. And that's, uh, this was in winter time. Then we tried to see how much, if you have to repair 
how good the repairs are. And as long as there's no hole in it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. So this is wave overtopping. Here you see, and this is quite interesting, because here you see, this is another location though, but here you see that you have got quite a good glass knot. You see that you have the, the surface is probably clay, and underneath there is sand. And what you see is that due to uh, animal burrows, and I'll show you later how it looks like, that you get a kind of hydraulic uh, disconnection between the surface and the underground of a, of a levee. And especially after we built all our levees in about from 1976, with first a uh, sand core, then a clay layer, and then grass. And you see, especially if you see that the old clay layers are yeah, kind of erosion of it, of the material, and you get animal behavior in it, then you get disconnections, and then things which look solid are not solid. <laughs> and that's always a pity, <laughs> because then, you, then, then strange things happen. So I'm coming back to the effect, or impact of the tidal marshes in beach grow. Here you see some technical calculations that you see if you use a sea salt marsh in the foreshore, you see a reduction of the wave height, but also of the wave impact. And what we're now trying to do there is to really calculate, not calculate first in advance with the models, and then calibrate the models how, how really big it is, and if it's really that one and a half meter and the impact of it. And it, if, you if that would be, then I think it would be a good measurement that you can also make uh, levees more resilient, and so your whole system more resilient, not by strengthening the infrastructure, but by, let's say, seawards or uh, uh, putting some, some things. You can also use dunes, but that's not always possible. <laughs> but the fact that it's more or less you go defend seawards, but not with high levees, but with, with let's say, to get the energy out of the, out of the system. These are... These are the wave impact machines. These were used at the thing. I think this is quite interesting because this is kind of thing what we're discovering. That you see all kind of little holes somewhere around. And we used the uh, GPR, we used the ground penetrating radar, we used ERT. We also used smoke bombs to see how, if there's connection between it. And what you see is they made an overview from, from them above. And you see two patterns. You see one pattern like this, and you see a scattered pattern. And the holes look all the same like this. They're fairly holes. And they could be from mice, they could be from moles, they could be from foxes, because they normally try to use each other holes. So you're not completely sure what it is. But if you look at the pattern, and you also know something about animal behavior, then you see these will probably be mice holes, because mice feed themselves on the surface. So they just have a hole to, to get some shelter and to sleep and something. Moles, by any end chance, are qu quite uh, interesting creatures because they uh, work and they live and they eat underground. And they, you, they like little uh, rainworms, so they, they, and the, but they also want to dig quite easy. So they try to get to dig on the sand core and eat in the clay where the nice little rainworms are. And the other thing is that they have kind of corridors because they have to drink and they don't get enough water from the, their food. So they've got the downstairs in the down under the levee where there's a lot of water, either from a, a, uh, or of, of groundwater where there's not moisture over there. So they use these corridors approximately three times a day from below and on the foot of the levee to the top of the levee. And then they dug sidewards to get their little rainworm farms uh, food. food. But what's interesting is, if you've got a lot of overtopping, then the water comes over here, and you get a kind of underground corridor, kind of metro or a highway, underground highway, which causes the, the, a lot of water going through it. So even if you have a good clay cover and a good cask cover over here, if you've got small holes over there, then you get a kind of, yeah, you get a kind of hydraulic uh, shortcut, and then you see that it will be spoiled, flushed away quite easily. And yeah, this is still the way how we detect them. So we're trying to get out, to find out if you can see use uh, infrared or uh, drones or other kinds of things to get the overview, how the pattern of those little uh, creatures are and what kind of impact they will have. And the other way, this is normally emergency response. This is uh, probably formerly uh, 
hole where first were rabbits, then there were foxes, and then the fox, yeah, they dug into the sand core, and then you see they put a lot of material outside it. Four times go, 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 but... Uh, you see also military people involved in this uh, project. I think we My work with... David Trubshaw, I work for the Environment Agency in our Asset Standards and Engineering team. We are uh, near Antwerp in uh, Belgium, so today I'm here to uh, help with this Polder 2 Seas project which I've um, been asked to be a part of. So in particular today I've been asked to come and have a look at the, the levee, or as we call embankment, uh, and to get a sort of baseline of where that is. You see the inspection, how they do inspection, a Dutch army and a Belgian person. Despite Corona, preparations are continuing for the first tests in the Living Lab Hedwig Prosper Polder. The kickoff for was organized on Tuesday, October 27, 2020, for which a special presentation was set up at the border. We call it the North morning. Korean South Korean approach. I'm uh, really proud to say that we just started now with uh, the first overflow experiments using the recently developed uh, overflow generator. This is uh, a Hello, polders to see. Uh, after one hour and 13 minutes, we have completely stopped the experiment. In the past two minutes, uh, the damage evolution has seriously increased its rate and we have created in a couple of minutes, and you see collapse going on, a really big hole with regression of the cliff by several meters. That was all due to animal activity, so. It was really high impact. Here we do some uh, emergency measure uh, measurements on levees. So with the old fashioned sandbags and uh, EPDF foil. I will foil. come back to you with the, with the final big bang. This is where the Dutch army is trying to, like the American army, to blow up a levee. This is, uh, these are 500 pounders from the British uh, Air Force at Second World War. Yeah, they, they would probably will succeed, yeah. Hi, this is here David on other place. I'm here at the section with the tree. The tree is still standing, yeah. and actually it has quite a bit more sand around its root system again. So, uh, we were trying to flush away a tree. We flushed away a lot of things, but the trees were very tough, so... <laughs> this is kind of how the UK uses uh, emergency repairs with big bags like uh, rocks. But I think we, at the end we overdid it a little bit, but uh, the system works. <laughs> we just uh, decided... For me, I'm stopping. I think we had six times go, 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 so that's okay. <laughs> I think this gives a general uh, overview of what's going on. Uh, I won't show this movie because it's in Dutch, but our uh, next week is the Delta Congress and uh, we have a nomination on, on our project together with two other projects, so we can always use a public vote on, on it. But are there any questions about what our main uh, ideas is about what we're trying to do? You have a question? I think... Uh, yeah, uses the uh, yeah, thanks for uh, the exciting project. Huh? Uh. It, it, it really is exciting what is happening there. <laughs> uh, oh, question over there. Uh, sedimentation uh, and the pollution issues with uh, PFAS? Um, we don't have them at the moment <laughs> because we don't use uh, water from the river Schelde and the natural PFAS concentrations are quite low. And I know it's a political issue, uh, but uh, uh, I think there is a lot of discussion between the Dutch government and the Belgium government about uh, you know, no, the fact that we don't want to have any PFAS in our whole system. But uh, the, 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 the pollution, the, they measured PFAS in the polder, so that's quite low, just a little bit above 
but below the standard. And also, the, force, the shores don't have that much uh, uh, PFAS. There's a lot of PFAS, but that's in the river uh, Schelde itself. And then behind the nuclear plant, here you have the city of Zwijndrecht. There's the 3M company. So if the 3M company stop putting PFAS in the water, yeah, it will flush away, and then you don't. And I think that's the system what they were going to do in, in the province of Zeeland, but also in Belgium, just stop the whole PFAS production or get it away, the, those 5,000 kilos, or deposit it somewhere, and then uh, in one year time it will be flushed away in the North Sea or uh, in general. Okay, let's okay. hope it stays yeah. away. Yeah. Let's hope it stays away. Now, it only stays away if you, if you don't produce PFAS or you don't put it in your system, and that's not... We also do the Netherlands at Dordrecht. It's the same kind of things. Uh, we're in a lot of companies who, who do it, but that's a different issue, I think. But that needs a legislation on on a, on a national level, both in effect on European level. But okay, thank you. Um, before we finish with the video, I think you want to uh, show the video uh, for a public vote, uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, first, finish with some questions. I see a finger raising here. Hi. Thank you for the nice presentation. I had a a bit more technical question, maybe, um, because you showed that in the project you also see the influence of, for example, foreshore for vegetation, yeah. and that you assess certain wave heights as well with, I guess, certain return yeah. intervals. Um, how do you think the conclusions would change if you're more facing open sea, so with waves more perpendicular, maybe with more power as well? Um, how widely applicable are the results that you get here, uh, deeper in the estuary for other environments? Uh, what you see, but then it's going to be more technical. In the 1953, when there was a lot of flooding in Zealand, you saw that the areas which had foreshore or where it was the second polder which was inundated, the width of, a, of the bre breach is not that wide, and also the depth of the breach, and especially the depth is, is the most dangerous part because then it's difficult to, to, to stop the breach. So what they're thinking is that uh, probably it will be like, uh, yeah, in fact, you don't want to have a breach, but if it's a breach with a foreshore, you can close it quite easily in, in one or two tides if you quite. If it's not that wide and not that deep, so that's a, so it, you're resilient in less wave impact. You're resilient in less. Uh, you need less wave height, or the existing wave height can be used for 50 years more. And the third part is that in your emergency response or in your safety response, so that's the the, the fifth phase then you can act more easily and, and stop the breach. And so you have inundated area, but you can recover it much easier. And there will be less damage to the in, more infrastructure. Yeah, OK. One final question for Ludolf. No? Well, then an applause. And then we will watch yeah. your video. Uh, try to get some votes. Uh, I'm sorry, you. this is only in Dutch, but it was for the Delta company. We zijn, we zijn nu op de Prosper Hittigendijk. Dijk. Deze dijk, deze dijk wordt af afgegraven volgend, volgend jaar, omdat, omdat die aan, die aan grote, grote tijden in het natuurgebied komt. komt. En de omstandigheden geven ons een kans om deze locatie als een leerling in lab te gebruiken, waardoor we grootschalige unieke innovaties kunnen testen en onderzoek kunnen doen, zodat we waar waterveiligheid aan hoge plannen zijn. We testen hier dus de sterkte van de dijk door middel van een overloopproef. Dus dan laten we heel veel water over de dijk lopen. En op sommige plekken gaat het dertig uur lang goed, is er geen schade. En op andere plekken is het na anderhalf uur is het gewoon boem, 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 Dertig man met wijze van spreken. En die lopen dan echt als een muurtje lopen ze over die dijk. En dan is Ja, yeah, I think uh, what, what you saw is that uh, we want to show them that that's not only in, in the research of the overflow, but also we're trying to innovate in, in the emergency response schadebeelden. En, op, en op die manier uh, weet je precies hoe de, de hoe dijk is en waar het dan link is. Focus ook op crisisbeheersing, want juist de, de collegiale so adviseringen in de militaire rijkswaterstaatwaterschappen, maar ook de burgers in vrijwillige uh, burgerwachten, om ver... I think it's good enough. So but we're focusing on, on three things. What I will show you in the video is both on, on, on flood response, uh, emergency response, but especially on educating the next generation. Because we, we think that's, that's not only because we, it's a philosophy, 
but you really need, let's say in our field, a lot of young professionals. And what you see, it's very difficult to get young professionals in a, a technical field because they're more interested to study economics or, or other kind of thing. And that's what uh, we're trying to do to make it a bit more attractive and also to, with the levy challenge and the winter schools uh, to get them involved and also try to, try to make them a little bit more enthusiastic about it. I think that it was uh, Petian. Thank you.